Good morning, everybody. This is John at Central Region. Just want to say thank you for uh, joining our science sharing webinar uh, today. And our topic today is a review of predicting ice accumulation from QPF. Phil Schumacher from WFO Sioux Falls will be our first speaker. And then uh, towards the end, we will have Carl Jungbluth from uh, WFO Des Moines will have a uh, case study. So, uh, Phil, uh, it's all yours. Thanks, John. I uh, pre appreciate you uh, letting Carl and I do this talk. Uh, um, I know I learned a lot going through the data. Just to let everyone know, this is really just a, a lit review that I did. It really started back in November when Carl brought up this problem of predicting ice or ice accumulation on a Sioux call, and he sent out a couple papers. And I was interested because last February we had a freezing rain event where we had a half inch of, of liquid fall over the northeastern part of our CWA, but yet had no problems. And, you know, standard rule is if you get a quarter inch or more, it should produce some, some issues in terms of limbs falling. So I started investigating it, and it led to discussions with Carl and with Kathleen Jones, who's uh, really the expert in this field over, over in New Hampshire with the Army Corps of Engineers. So next slide. So it got me thinking about, as I read the papers of what we could change. Well, the current practice, at least in our office here in Sioux Falls, and, and I, I believe with the surra my surrounding offices, and if I'm wrong, they can correct me, is that we basically use a one-to-one -one ratio on ice to water. So if we produce a quarter inch of, of liquid, we go with a quarter inch of ice, and that's our criteria for issuing a, a ice storm warning. But in fact, ice, as we all know, is less dense than water. And the ratio of ice to water is approximately 1.1 to 1. So when you use that assumption of, of 1 to 1 that, that at least we're using here in Sioux Falls, it implies a few, few things. First of all, it implies that, that almost all of the water is freezing. There's absolutely no runoff going on, regardless if it's the temperature is 24 or 32 degrees. It also implies that you're on a flat, horizontal surface. And it does not really account for different geometries of objects. So we're basically just forecasting ice on the ground. And as we'll see, that, that's a pretty big assumption. Next slide. So you know, Jones et al. did a paper in 2004 where they looked at an event um, across the southern U.S. into the eastern U.S. And they have this example here from Greensville, Spartansburg, South Carolina from December 2002. And on the left, you can see the accumulating precipitation in millimeters. So you got a little over 21 millimeters. And if you go through, about 14 millimeters of that was all freezing rain. The first six or seven of it was uh, a mix of freezing rain and sleet. Um, and then on the right, you have the ice accumulation. And there were three different ways of doing the ice accumulation. One was using the ASOS icing algorithm, which Carl will go into a little bit, although I think it's different now that's being tested across the region than what was being used back in 2002, which was a wire. Um, and then two different models. One is called the Krell model, which is a very sophisticated engineering model that takes into account a lot of different things. And then the simple model, which just is basically taking into account um, wind, precipitation rate, and, the, and makes the assumptions on the geometry. And the simple model is what I'll be presenting here. But you can see that the icing algorithm actually only got six millimeters of ice accumulating. Um, instead of, it wasn't 14 or 17 um, millimeters, it was 6. So it was on the order of 30, 30, 0 0.33 to 0.4 to 1. So it was nowhere near the 1 to 1 ratio. Next slide. So that brings into a, a, a very important question. When we're forecasting ice accumulation and issuing ice storms warnings, what are we issuing the warnings for? Are we issuing the warning for ice accumulation on the ground? In other words, are we issuing for a flat, horizontal, two-dimensional surface? Or are we issuing it because of damage to property and infrastructure? And when you start talking about that, you're starting to talk about three-dimensional surfaces, particularly wires and branches, which are elevated and cylindrical, so that um, water or ice can accumulate over a larger area than being impacted. So as I thought about this, and as I talked to Carl about this too, when you think about it, the impact on ice on the ground itself really begins at a few hundredths of an inch um, and really doesn't change markedly with in increased ice accumulation. You know, really our basis for an advisory is really does it become an inconvenience to walk or to drive? You know, do conditions become dangerous for walking or driving? 
And you only need, as we all know, a little bit of freezing drizzle can create really hazardous conditions if the temperatures are at the right level and, and um, streets are untreated or sidewalks are untreated. But whether you have a tenth of an inch of ice or a quarter inch of ice doesn't really make that much of a difference. However, when you get to wires and branches and damage to them, studies have shown that that starts occurring around eight millimeters or between a quarter and a third of an inch of ice accumulation on an object. And since most of the damage that we see from ice storms is really due to falling branches and falling wires, in which case you start getting people to have no longer have electricity, people become trapped in their houses because streets are impassable, that's when it becomes a life threat, more of a life-threatening um, situation, or at least I would argue that. Next slide. So that gets to the question, are, are wires or branches different? If ice accumulation on wires and branches are creating those life-threatening conditions, then really should we be basing our warnings on accumulation on the ground, or should we be basing our warnings on accumulation on wires and branches? So I'll kind of leave that question hang out there. Um, uh, you know, that's for each of us to decide to some extent. Um, like I said, my opinion is that with wires and branches, that's what, those coming down is what changes the conditions from being hazardous for driving to being life-threatening for people. Um, but if you do assume that you're really looking at accumulations of, on wires and branches, then is there a difference in accumulation of ice on that wire or branch than there is on the ground? Next slide. So that gets into the simple model that was developed by Kathleen Jones. Um, and I talked to her about this. She sent me her 1996 uh, paper, um, which is a, a Corps of Engineers um, volume, a 15-page volume, actually, or whatever. Um, it's not published in a journal. And she developed both the simple model and that Krell model that I showed earlier. And I asked her which was better. And she said, for most applications, actually, the simple model suffices. Um, you don't need the complexity of the Krell model. And let me tell you, you don't want that complexity. I went through that equation. It's, it's pretty brutal. So we're just going to do the simple model here. And it's also shown in our 2004 paper as well, which is in Monthly Weather Review. And what we're going to be pre predicting is the thickness of ice on a branch. That's R sub E. And you can see in the diagram up there that it's basically just the thickness from the surface of the object, whether it be a wire or a branch, to where the top of the wire, to where the ice exits. So it's not the thickness of the branch, branch minus you know, the thickness of the, all the ice minus the thickness of the branch, it's just that radius of it. So, and that's very important to consider. Um, but when we do this, there are a lot of assumptions involved. First of all, we're going to assume that any temperature below zero degrees C, all water freezes on contact. So we're ignoring the impact of latent heat release and of runoff and of also of other things such as conduction, convection near the branch itself, that type of thing. But what Jones found is that much of the water that runs off will actually eventually form into icicles, especially as temperatures fall lower, farther below freezing. And even though it's not part of the thickness of the ice on the branch per se, it's still added weight to that wire branch and can, add, can increase the stress on that wire branch. We're also going to assume a droplet distribution described by Best 1950. This was developed for rainfall, so it's, it's somewhat analogous to the Marshall Palmer um, droplet distribution. The key is, is that we're assuming larger raindrops. And as you'll see in a little bit, the size of the raindrops makes a big difference in how efficient icing occurs on, on wires and branches. Um, the smaller the raindrops, the more efficient the process. So it's not going to do as well for drizzle as it will for rainfall. The other thing we're going to assume is the wire to branch ratio or wire or branch ratio of diameter to length is very large. In other words, the length is the infinite size compared to the diameter. And we're finally going to assume the water spreads evenly over the entire surface of the wire or branch. Next slide. So we're going to determine the amount of water that can freeze. And I apologize for some of the equations here, but it makes it a little bit easier to, to describe and, and also make, well, allow the equation to make sense where it comes from. So essentially what we need to do is we need to determine the mass flux of the water, the liquid water, onto that branch or that wire. And so I'm going to compare the ground to that wire branch. So you can see how both are derived and why the differences will occur. So on the ground, you're essentially looking at a 2D flat surface. So it's just the density of water 
multiplied by the rainfall rate, very crudely, because that's all, you're just looking at the falling rain onto the ground. But for an elevated surface, it's a little bit different, because now it's more than just falling water. You can also have water being affected horizontally. So you have the vertical flux, which is the rainfall falling, which is the same as the, what the ground sees, rho sub w times the rainfall rate, plus the horizontal flux, which is the wind speed times the liquid water content of the air. And so to get the net flux, it's just like, taking, it's just like the Pythagorean theorem. You take the, the vertical component, square that, plus the horizontal component, square that, and take the square root of that. And that's your net flux on, per unit area onto any three-dimensional surface. And as, just for your information, the liquid water content in this case from a best distribution is equal to 0 0.067 times the rainfall rate taken to, you know, a power of 0.846. So that's what we'll be plugging into W a little bit later. Next slide. So now we have to figure out the surface area that water can freeze on. So on the ground, it's just basically the area, x some length times the length L. So pretty, pretty simple, it's two-dimensional. But on a wire, you're looking at a cylinder, and we're assuming a perfect cylinder here. So it's basically the diameter of the wire times the length of the wire times pi. And that will give you your surface area of your cylinder. Next slide. Next, you have to figure out the area that the water is impinging on. Essentially, that's just a cross-sectional area of the object. So for the ground, it's, again, just the area, x times l. It doesn't change. But for a wire, it's a little bit different. It's actually the diameter of the wire multiplied by the length. And I just want to note that this really only works for a circular cylinder. Um, if you're not circular, then the flux vector that we're going to talk about in a little bit becomes dependent upon the orientation at flux vector to the major and minor axis of the object. But we're going to just assume a perfect circle here so we don't have to worry about that, that, ratio, that angle to the major axis. So it's just D, the diameter, times the length of the wire. Next slide. Finally, now you've got to spread all that water that's impinging on the cross-sectional area over the entire surface. And to find the depth of the water spread over the entire surface area, it's just the ratio of the cross-sectional area to the surface area. So for the ground, it's 1. You, you basically eliminate it. Um, for a cylinder, though, the cross-sectional area is D times L, but the surface area is pi times D times L. So that means for a cylinder, the, the ratio is 1 over pi, or essentially almost one-third. So you're going to have less water, less, a lower, the depth of the water on the surface area, on the entire wire, is going to be less than that on the depth on the ground. So the other thing this means is that the ice accumulation on any circular object, whether it be a branch or a wire, is independent of the diameter. And that makes it kind of neat, because now you don't have to worry whether a bigger branch is going to accumulate a larger thickness of ice than a very thin branch. Next slide. I should point out, though, that the mass of the water, of course, will be very different, because, of course, when you, if you take the volume of ice over a much larger branch, there's going to be much more ice on there. So there will be a, a larger mass of ice. It's just that the thickness will be the same. So the depth of that water, then, is just the area time, the air, the area that we described below times the flux. So for the ground, it's that ratio, 1 times rho w times r. But for the elevated cylinder, it's 1 over pi times the flux vector, um, rho, sum, rho sub w times r squared plus u times w squared, which is the liquid water content, and the square root of that, times the amount of time that you're, you have that rate and that wind speed, u. So to get the ice accumulation, then, you just take the ratio of water to ice, rho w divided by rho i, or the density of water divided by the density of ice, and you come out with the equation below. So what you see is, is that the thickness of ice is a function of the wind speed, is a function of the liquid water content, which is, which is in itself a function of the rainfall rate. Next slide. Now, um, you have to convert all the units so they come into units that we're used to using. Um, for this equation, I just converted it to millimeters per hour. Um, in the spreadsheet, the graphs I'll show you later, I actually converted it from all the way down to inches per hour and not. So it's in, actually in values that we actually use. So as you can see, all you do to get the rainfall rate 
take the bottom equation, it's just a summation of the rainfall rate um, at each hour times the wind, plus the wind speed at each other, so the horizontal and vertical flux each other, and that, then you add that together for the number of hours that you have freezing rain in your area. Does that make sense? Are there any questions at this point and about how, how this works in general? Okay, next slide. So what's this formula mean? I mean, that's why we're all here. What it means is that if there's no wind, the ratio of ice on the ground to ice on a cylinder is 1 over, over the density of ice to, over pi. And what this means is that the depth of an ice on a cylinder, wire or branch, is approximately 35.4% of the depth on the ground. So if we, get in, if we just have a calm wind and we get an inch of freezing rain, it's only going to come up to being just a little over a third of an inch of ice, which means that although we're looking at it going, holy cow, we're going to get an inch of ice and thinking, you know, it's going to be devastation, we're actually on, on, on cylindrical surfaces are only going to accumulate around a third of an inch of ice, which is marginal for starting to get damage to branches and wires. And this is kind of what we saw last year um, up in, in our CWA. We had, I said, a half inch of ice and almost no damage whatsoever reported, other than the inconvenience to driving, of course. But I do want to point out that this best distribution is for rain. For smaller droplets, the liquid water content is going to be larger, and the horizontal flux will be underestimated. So, so if we have drizzle, it's going to do, and we have wind, you're going to get more of a horizontal. You're going to get more ice accumulating than you would expect from the formula. The other thing is, if the wind is very high, in other words, you have a large horizontal flux of water, then ice accumulation on wires could be much higher than it is on the ground. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Next slide. In fact, we'll talk about that a lot more later, <laughs> to be honest, because it has huge implications to, to drizzle. So what I'm going to follow up here with is a bunch of graphics of, of what this formula means. So this first slide shows if you hold the rainfall constant, which is um, the different lines on the graph there, um, and you change the wind speed, how does the ratio of precipitation rate to ice accumulation rate change? And you can see that no matter what the rainfall rate is, at no wind speed, calm wind zero, the rate is 0.35. That's where it all ends on the far left side of the screen. But as we increase the wind speed, the ratio changes by the rainfall rate. If we have very light rain, you know, 0.01 inches per hour, and you have a 20 knot wind, your ratio is going to be greater than one to one. But if, you have, if you're getting a heavier rainfall, you know, a tenth or two tenths of an inch per hour, even with a 20 knot wind, your rainfall rate is going to be down towards 0 0.7, 0 0.8 um, to one. So it makes a huge difference in terms of the ratio on what your rate is per hour. And the wind speed makes a huge difference as well. And we'll, we'll look at this in, in a, more of a practice in a little bit. Next slide. The other thing you can do is hold the wind speed constant, which is each of the lines there, and then vary the rainfall rate. And what you can see is that with very low winds, one to two knots, which is the green, the kind of green and the dark blue line at the bottom, there's basically no change um, with uh, the ratio. The ratio stays right around that 0.35 to 1, no matter if it's a hundredth of an inch per hour or two tenths of an inch per hour. But when you have a 20 knot wind, there's a marked change based on what the, the rate is. With very low rainfall rates, a couple hundredths to three hundredths of an inch per hour, you're going to be accumulating ice at better than one to one. But when you, if you have, get that rate down to two tenths, up, that rate up to two tenths of an inch per hour, then that ratio falls below 0.8 to one. So you can just see that not your, the amount of wind that you have plays a fairly large factor in the amount of ice that you're going to be able to accumulate. And in addition, the amount of rain that's falling also plays a role in how much you can accumulate because it changes the angle of that flux onto the object, in, in essence. How that rain is hitting the object changes by how fast the wind is and how hard the rain is falling. Next slide. So I have an example here. If you take 12 hours of rainfall and you just assume a, a rate of about 300, yeah, it's 300 of an inch per hour. Okay? And so you have different wind speeds here. Um, so you say, okay, I have 
I have a calm, everywhere from a calm wind to a wind up to 20 knots. So how much ice is going to accumulate over that, that, that hour where you would get, expect to get 36 hundredths of an inch of rain? Well, you can see at 20 knots, you're almost at one to one. So you get almost the same amount of ice accumulating on the branch as you get water accumulating on the ground. But as the wind speed lowers, the amount of ice that accumulates on the branch begins to fall. And so by the time we're with a calm wind, you can see that you're only getting a little over a tenth of an inch of ice accumulating on the ground. And again, what that means is, is that you're looking at a difference between having an advisory, in essence, because you're not going to get enough ice accumulating on a branch to, that would likely cause branches or wires to start breaking, to with a stronger wind where you would likely need an ice storm warning, you will begin to see damage to ice you know, so branches and wires and such. Okay, next slide, please. Similarly, you can see the difference in, in ice accumulation based on, on precipitation rate. Um, I have different rain. Rain is dashed on this figure, and the rates are next to it, so the purple is like a hundredth of an inch per hour. And then you can see the rain accumulation and the ice accumulation. And then you can see the different with different accumulations, you get different amounts of ice accumulating. Now, the hard, not surprisingly, the harder it rains, the more ice you're going to get, irrespective of how quote-unquote efficient it is. But the difference is, is that the, efficient, the amount of ice may not be as much as you think. For example, if you have, with a 15-knot wind, if you're getting two-tenths of an inch of rain per hour, you can get over two inches of, of precipitation, but only an inch and a half of ice. And, you know, down in Paducah, Carl talked to Pat a little bit, and down there, I think they ended up, they had about three and a quarter inches of water and about an inch and a half or a little over of ice. So, so you could see that the rate, the rate was so heavy, you didn't get three inches of ice covering everything, you only got an inch and a half. So, so we see this in nature actually happening. I mean, an inch and a half of ice is still going to do a lot of damage, but it's not 2.4 inches. And you can see that the ratio changes as you, as you change that rate. You're, you're at about 60%. With a 20-knot wind, you're around 66%. With a 15-knot wind, all the way down to almost 100% with a, with a hundredth of, or it's all 15-knot wind, I'm sorry. You're at 60% with 15 hundredths of an inch per hour, and you're at 100% with a hundredth of an inch per hour. Next slide. So what this means is for a given wind speed, the lower the rain rate, the higher the ratio of ice to water accumulation. Okay? So... If we can have, if we can, the, so even though there's instances where maybe a hundredth or two hundredths of an inch, if you have enough wind, you probably, your one-to-one -one is probably going to work pretty well. But if you're getting two-tenths of an inch or a tenth of an inch per hour with a relatively light wind, that one-to-one -one is way going to overestimate your amount of ice accumulation on a branch or wire. The other thing is, is for a given rainfall rate, the higher the wind speed, the higher the ratio of ice to water. Where this becomes important to us is that for a marginal icing event, a change in wind speed of 5 or 10 knots can mean the difference between an advisory and possibly significant damage from both ice accumulation on the wire, and then also if the wind speeds are higher enough, you, you actually increase the stress on the structures because you're blowing those wires horizontally with a lot more weight on them. Okay, next slide. So again, if we look at our example from earlier, and I take out the sleep part of it, um, you get a ratio close to 0.45 to 1. But notice the simple model still overestimated the ASOS icing algorithm or what was observed. That's because, as I said, it's ignoring latent heat and it's ignoring runoff. If you're near 32 degrees, not all that water that hits that wire is going to freeze. Some of it's going to drip off. Um, what rate, some of it will form icicles, sure, but some of it will drip off. And that runoff becomes increasingly important as the wet bulb temperature approaches freezing. But I would argue, given the errors we have in QPF and wind speed, it still provides a much better forecast than just blindly throwing one-to-one -one around um, for, for all events. Next slide. The last thing I want to cover is advection fog and drizzle. As we all know, we get freezing drizzle that causes ice accumulations. Um, and then in a few extreme cases, you can have fog that accretes a lot of ice onto structures. But many fog and drizzle events have trace precipitation. In other words, the precipitation rate is very close to zero. And for all practice, practical purposes in our grids, we probably put zero 
or maybe a hundredth in a six hour QPF group. However, the liquid water content of the air then becomes no longer related to the precipitation rate. And that's because droplets are now suspended in the air rather than falling. And if, if the liquid water content is large enough and there's a strong enough wind, one could end up with significant ice accumulation with trace ground precipitation. And I'll have an example coming up shortly. But why is that? Well, it's because the horizontal flux will be very large, much larger than the vertical flux is, which will be near zero. And therefore, it's all driven by the wind advecting water droplets onto surfaces. Next slide. So we're going to look at a case here. I'll go through these pretty fast. But this is from South, this occurred in South Dakota and North Dakota. And I want to thank um, Mike Fall and, and Josh Sheck, who provided some of the information that I, I've got and gave me the information on the case. Uh, but this, is, this occurred between the 18th of January and the 24th of January, 2010. And so we're just going to go through the 500 in the upper left and the surface on the upper left, right, on the lower right, I'm sorry. Um, and this is just a classic pattern for a persistent low overclass event that's described by Rober et al. in 1998. And if you haven't read that paper, it's a very good at trying to pick up patterns with long-lived low stratus events. So what we've got here is just starting on the 18th, you can see a wave going across the U.S.-Canadian border, high pressure across the eastern Dakotas and western Minnesota at this time. Um, it's a little hard to see, but winds at this time are fair, near calm um, across the eastern Dakotas. And that's going to allow fog to begin to form across the area. Next slide. You can see that a upper level ridge builds over us. You can see the high slowly slides off to the east, but we keep a southeasterly flow across the area that's relatively stable flow, actually, as you're starting to get warm air, as depicted by the warm front over the western plains, starting to come over the top. So you're creating a very stable environment where fog has already formed. Um, and we'll see in a little bit that there's pretty low visibility across, across the eastern Dakota. Next slide. As we go ahead to the 20th, the upper ridge remains over the area. You see the, the warm front remains south and west. Yeah, the warm front remains south and west. You have low pressure going to the south of us. That has allowed a little bit of, of actually snow and freezing rain to fall across the area. Not a lot, as we'll see in a little bit, but enough to moisten, continue to moisten the boundary layer and to keep that fog persistent across the eastern Dakotas. Next slide. Actually, most of the Dakotas, are, in, in fact, it actually affected all the way out to the Montana border. Now you're beginning to see a trough that's starting to move into the western U.S. As a result, you're starting to get a little bit of lower pressures out west. You're strengthening the southeasterly flow across the area. So our wind speeds, which were relatively light, maybe around 10 knots, are beginning to slowly increase in time, but yet we still have some fog and so across the Dakotas at this time continuing to, to affect the area on the 21st. As we head into the 22nd, which is the next slide, that the trough continues to move east, you get a stronger flow across the Dakotas as well. Again, you see the southeasterly flow throughout Nebraska, south and north Dakota. Um, again, visibilities are relatively lower, but wind speeds have picked up and we're starting to see higher gusts. Next slide. So what I have here is a trace. We're just using Huron, South Dakota as an example. Um, red is temperature, green is dew point, and you can see that uh, after the 17th of January, which is on the left, basically the temperature dew point spread stayed right around 1 to 2 degrees Fahrenheit, um, which is pretty typical for a below freezing fog event across the area because you'd still have, with snow on the ground, and there was snow on the ground across the entire region, you still get some, some um, of the moisture falling out as frost or freezing the surfaces. Um, that helps keep the dew point closer to the ice, icing temperature, ice wet bulb, or whatever you want to call it, rather rather than 100% relative. The relative humidity with respect to height is near 100%, not with respect to water. Okay, next slide. So this slide is the visibility, and so it goes up to 10 miles. So you can see on the 17th, beginning of the 18th overnight, you had fog form, dense fog form in Huron, and that was when winds were, rel as we'll see in a little bit, when winds were relatively light. Um, you do have, you see though that the fog, not really dense fog, you know, one to three mile fog, remained across the area all day on the 19th. Then we had a little bit of that freezing rain and snow 
on the 20th, but notice the freezing rain only accumulated 6 hundredths of an inch. Um, the snow was only a couple hundredths of an inch, or two, probably 2 tenths or 3 tenths of an inch of snowfall depth. Um, and then once that went by, visibilities again fell to below 3 miles, or you know, at times were up to as high as 5 miles. And then as we got later into the 22nd, some rain actually moved in the area. And then as the front came through, that, that gradually changed the snow. But total precipitation over the six-day period is only two-tenths of an inch for Huron. And it wasn't that much different anywhere else. So in terms of precipitation, specifically frozen precipitation, ice or snow, it's only a tenth of an inch. And so that, you'd think that would not be a huge problem. But if we go to the next slide, we'll see the wind speeds. And you can see that winds, as, again, when the fog first formed, it's calm. But as the winds picked up, they were around 10 knots. 10 to 15 knots for about two straight days with gusts between 20, 15 and 25 knots. And then on the 22nd, when you still had relatively low visibilities, again, three to five miles, you had gusts over, over 30 knots at times with sustained speeds between 15 and 20 knots. So you can imagine all, this, all these liquid cloud particles at the surface being infected onto surfaces over multiple days. So even, even though we didn't have extremely dense fog, just the day after day of 10 to 15 knot winds, having all this fog droplets hitting surfaces was a tremendous amount of ice gradually building up on wires. And so our next slide will show you the results of that. And these, are, these photos are from J.P. Martin up in Bismarck and uh, the Basin Electric Cooperative from Bismarck. But you can see here, this is what happened. You've got all this ice, and you can, I, I'm assuming this is from the south or west, that accumulated on this, on this fence here. Look at all the ice that's on those wires. And this was taken seven days after the event. So, this, so you can imagine what it might have looked like on the January 22nd before the winds came in. And one thing I didn't show you is that the winds, I only showed you the winds up to 0 on the 23rd, but winds actually increased up to 30 to 40 knot gusts uh, after the cold front came through. But you see it knocked down large transformer wires and everything. And the last picture um, we'll show you is, is that wooden wooden um, power poles were snapped in between the wind and the ice. So this was a significant event. So if you go to the next slide, the yellow counties are all the counties that were affected just by the 22nd of January. So there was still another day of high winds that came through that really knocked out power across the northern part of the South Dakota. There were over 5,000 power poles down, 21,000 miles of lines taken down, and thousands of people without power. And there were several, there were significant areas that were without power for, for weeks at a time for an event that produced less than a quarter inch of QPF. Next slide. Just in conclusion, what you see here, and this is an extreme example that I just showed, is the current methodology of one-to-one -one can really overestimate ice accumulation. Well, in this, it can overestimate ice accumulation in rainfall events. And that's because ice accumulation is a function on branches and wires is a function of rainfall rate and wind speed. There's a vertical and horizontal flux. But also, not to be forgotten, is droplet size. Droplet size and shape is very important in, when you look at it. And if you have drizzle and fog, a lot of the assumptions that were made in the formula I showed earlier fall apart because the horizontal flux is higher, it's much higher, and the rain, liquid water content of the air is no longer a function of the rainfall rate. And that's because droplets tend to be suspended in those cases and are no longer falling. So the other thing to keep in mind is you will overestimate ice accumulation in near freezing events or very heavy rainfall when latent heat release is more important. However, since this ratio is already less than one to one, it does better than the current methodology, at least what we're using here. But I think another big question is, is how do we treat these advection fog and accretion events where ice to rain ratios can exceed two to one or even five to one? I mean, there wasn't a ruler on those branches or wires, but there was well over an inch of ice caked on there in an event that had two-tenths of an inch of water at most. And so I know when that event occurred, we had no ice storm warnings out, but the effect of that event was as if an ice storm had just hit the Dakotas, and we, had, we did not know what to do with it. So that's all I've got. Um, I guess before we pass it on to Carl, Matt and Brad also provided a lot of comments on the original version of this talk, so I'd like to thank them for that as well. Um, before we pass it to Carl, are there any questions uh, about what I showed? Hey, Phil, this is Brian Bargenbrook. Yes. Um, I, uh, I really like this presentation. It, 
and the example is really pretty amazing. Um, I uh, I looked, let's see, two winter seasons ago at the Jones equation, and ended up putting together a uh, a GFE smart tool for a first guess, if nothing else. Uh, I was wondering if you'd put together any sort of smart tools for use in GFE for for first guesses or forecasting purposes, and and if not, or if so, maybe we could uh, get together and uh, I could uh, maybe see a few more of these uh, uh, assumptions that you've made that seem to be a little more accurate than what I had put together. Maybe we could work on something to send out. Well, Brian, I, I have not put together a smart tool. I, I, did, I did put it into a spreadsheet, you know, the equation, so I think it'd be oh, okay. easy to take that equation and put it in the smart tool. The reason I didn't is because I knew somebody had written a smart tool already, so I didn't want to reinvent the wheel. So gotcha. Someone on the call would already have the equation, and we, we could get together, just as you suggest, and we could we can compare the equation that I used in, in Excel to the equation that like that you wrote for GFE, and we could kind of meld them together. Sure, sure. And, and based on what I see now on my screen, uh, it looks like maybe Carl has a has a tool to talk about there as well. So I may have jumped the gun on that one. Oh, no problem. <laughs> All right. Hey, thanks again for the presentation. You're, you're welcome. Thanks for the comment. Any other questions? Okay, well, if not, I'll, I will put it on mute here and, and pass it on to Carl. Okay, thanks, Phil. Really good job. And Brian, I'm talking about a smart tool that I did not write, and I feel bad now. I don't know who the author of the tool is. I hear it came out of Eastern Region, from what I remember. So what we've done here, and we'll review, is a, a number of things, but that smart tool is an ICQ smart tool that's already available in your GFE and Rod Donovan, our GFE focal point here, has looked at it quite a bit. He's done comparisons similar to what Phil did of outcome from the tool and the uh, simple method there, and they're very similar. So we'll talk about that a little bit. That's kind of the main goal. So we're going to use an event, John, if you advance the slide, that occurred two weekends ago now. On the 27th of January, we had a vort lobe lift up out of the southwest that produced some freezing rain over Iowa, so we'll take a look at that event. I take a note there in the northeast quarter of Iowa that reported ice accumulation from LSRs was around three-tenths of an inch, and there's an area there with four-tenths and a half inch up in north-central Iowa. That's what was reported in LSRs, and we'll talk about that a little later. But basically, we're there in central Iowa, and we had around a tenth to fifteen hundredths of an inch of QPE, or liquid precipitation. So if you go forward, John, that shows the measured precipitation we had. And this is in two parts because it's from co-op from two different days. The event occurred on a Sunday morning. So we had a, around a quarter of an inch of rain <coughs> Excuse me. in southwest Iowa. A lot of that was not freezing rain because temperatures were a little warmer. Then it was a little less on the freezing precip in central Iowa around, like I said, a tenth to 1,500s, and then we had more precipitation occur in the eastern half of the state. So you'll notice the black line there is a quarter of an inch of melted precipitation. Some of the um, LSR ice amounts we got we actually exceeded the amount of liquid precipitation for this event, so that's an issue we'll talk about a little bit. So if we jump ahead now to the tool, Basically, it's called the Isocume tool. It mirrors a simple method quite well, and like I said, Rod has tested that out quite a bit here, along with some numbers Phil ran and we ran here. <coughs> and like Phil said, as long as the temp is, is at freezing or less, it accumulates ice in this grid. And so the main parameters that go into the tool are the wind speed and your QPF, which QPF relates to what Phil talked about as your you know, your flux of water, basically. It derives that from the QPF. And so the tool, as long as you you have ice mentioned in your weather grid, it's going to keep on accumulating it no matter what you have in the temperature grid as long as it's below freezing. So we know that's a lot of assumptions there, but that's how the tool works. It's very, very, uh, what would you call it, reliable to the simple method. So as Phil noted, at 20 knots of wind, the QPF ratio to the ice ratio is one to one in the tool, and we'll show a couple examples of that. So thanks to Rod for working on this, and Shane, our ITO, for getting a lot of this stuff on the west so I could show it to you. If we go ahead, so I just picked a six-hour period and a six-hour QPF, 
to look at here. So this was the uh, QPF, and you'll note there kind of where it goes from the blue to the green is around 15 hundredths of an inch. The 0.09 there in the middle of, uh, of the CWA there is our station here. We actually measured 11 hundredths of an inch of QPE, so it was a pretty good forecast. So if we go ahead, John, and so you run the isocume tool, and here's the output from that tool. So you can see it cuts off to zero very near central Iowa because our temperatures were near freezing, so we were above freezing southwest of that line and below freezing. And the amounts of ice that it produced were, you know, roughly three-quarters of the amount of QPF we had forecast until you get right next to the, the purple line there where it went to zero because temperatures got above freezing. So this was a kind of an interesting event because we started out above freezing in temperature-wise, and then as the saturation occurred and we went to the wet bulb, temperatures fell below freezing by a degree or two. So things were a little interesting because a lot of sites had a little bit of rain before it actually turned to freezing rain, so that kind of preconditioned surfaces a little bit. You didn't have just every bit of the rain falling, freezing to things from the beginning. And also metal things like wires were probably a little warmer than they would have been if it would have, had been starting out well below freezing for the event. So if we jump ahead, John, I think the next is a comparison of the ice ratio. And the ice ratio grid doesn't come out of the tools it is in GFE, but Rod configured this so we could take a look at the ratio of ice to QPF coming out of the tool. It's a nice thing to have, and it was a pretty simple thing for him to do. So we'll make sure we share that for you here after the webinar. But you can see it might be a little hard to read. In the kind of gold color there, you're looking at about 3 quarters or 75 percent of the QPF was turned to ice, and the wind field there in that area was around 14 knots. So most of the CWA, the winds are in the 10 to 12 knot range with the maximum there in east central Iowa of around 14 knots. So that's, you can see the direct correlation to where the ice tool went with the highest ratio was where the winds were higher. So if you go to the next slide, just for grins, I increased the winds across the CWA by, I think, around six knots. So we got an area of 20 knots that shows up there in the orange. And you can see the tool went pretty well right to a one-to-one -one ratio in that area until the temperatures got above freezing. So it's pretty simplistic, really, but it's nice to have this tool available that really mirrors the, the simple method quite well. So that's pretty much all I want to say about that. At the end of the PowerPoint that John will distribute, there's another example of the ice tool and the ice ratio with wind, just so that everybody can see that. I think pictures help it sink in better for everyone. So if you jump ahead, John, let's try to keep moving. So as we started looking at this tool, we thought, well, we need some real observations. And if you look through the papers and a lot of the research, there isn't a lot of good observations that had quality measurements of the QPE that was recorded and the ice that was recorded. So we talked to our local power company, MidAmerican Energy, about this and said we'd like some wires to do some measurements on. And so they tend to sent us 10 different samples, which was way more than we expected. And our DAPM, Rod DeRoy, put it up on a, a rack in the backyard. And it's never a pretty scene when there's freezing rain, as you can tell there. But <laughs> there's a, a half a dozen wires that are just uh, strands of metal cable, basically, from around a quarter inch to a half inch in diameter. And then the ones in the front there are kind of braided cables where you have a metal wire and some plastic coated plastic sheath cables. And so how these collected ice would, you can expect would be very different as amount of the way they absorb heat, the way their temperature hangs around, all that kind of stuff. So we had a lot of difference with that as we measured. So our super intern and one of our student volunteers went out and measured freezing rain on this Sunday morning. We had the rain gauge there, which we brought in every hour as we went out there to to keep an, you know, an accurate measurement of how much liquid water fell each hour. We melted that down and came in. So if you go ahead, so we basically had measurable precipitation for five hours. The liquid equivalent measured here was 11 hundredths of an inch, so not a real heavy event. And we took OBS every hour. The winds were from the south-southeast at 8 to 14 miles an hour, so kind of in the low to mid range for a typical freezing event, I think. 
we oriented those wires perpendicular to the wind direction so that they have the chance to pick up the maximum amount of that horizontal wind, horizontal flux of moisture into the wires. And so our greatest accumulation on that piece of plywood was five hundredths of an inch, so quite a bit less than one to one. It was kind of melting and running off. Our temperature was in the 30 to 31 and a half degree range while this occurred. The biggest multi-strand wire had nine hundredths. So here's a picture of how it occurred. And the, these cables collected more water than the, uh, our staff's kind of chuckling. It's Kevin with his headlamp on there <laughs> in the dark. <laughs> but uh, the uh, cables collected more ice, the plastic ones, and also the multiple cables, because the, the water seemed to be able to kind of run in between and kind of pool up in between the cables as, as opposed to dripping off. So quite a bit of difference there if you go to the next slide. And this, just a quick review, you can look at this later on, but different sizes of wires, it was difficult to measure because the ice was kind of mushy. It didn't really get hard and solid on there and dripping off the bottom somewhat, that type of thing. So we had anywhere from 200 of an inch of radial ice up to 900 of an inch of radial ice with 1,100 inch of QPE. So that was our measurement. It would be sure nice to get a lot more events with, of this, but, you know, we don't want too many icing events either as far as public impacts go. Mm -hmm. We jump ahead, John. And... Uh, this slide just says, you know, the, diff the difficulties in measuring. We had the pooling of water. You saw those wires kind of sagged a little bit. So if it's a, a warm event or high rain rates, the water is going to be running down the lines as opposed to hanging off and just dripping uniformly as a more horizontal wire. So all kinds of things like that could factor in. You can go ahead. So I wanted to give you a little bit of info on the ASOS, which there's test sites with the new build that are running in ICQM grid that's referenced in the papers Phil was talking about way back into the early 2000s, but we're just now getting it online so we can see reports of several sites there here in, in the central region are getting these observations, including us, so that was interesting to see. So it, it basically how the, the probe works, which is a vertical probe measuring horizontal or planar ice, which is kind of interesting, but <laughs> the probe resonates and it, the resonance changes as it collects ice. And then the cone under the probe, as I understand it, heats up and melts the ice off every time it gets to 800 of an inch. So you can have, in a warm situation, you can have some delay as that cools back off. So you might miss a little ice cube there. It will accumulate ice for any number of things that would cause ice to form on that probe, including the things like Phil showed with the drizzle, fog, frost, freezing rain. And as long as the sensor is not recording snow, it's going to give you an ICQM readout on the observation, which we'll show next. Go ahead, John. Well, not next, but so this I'll just breeze right through. It pretty much says what I just told you, but it's again measuring what should be ice on a flat surface. It's not measuring radial ice. They reference in the, the release notes, which I forwarded to John so he can make available. They mentioned that uniform radial thickness would be 37 to 40 percent, whereas Phil says the bottom bottom line there is about 33 percent so at least we're in agreement there on what they're talking about next slide here's the ob so it will add into your METAR this I group and then the number after the I is the number of hours so it could be a one hour accumulation a three hour accumulation or six hour in this case it's a synoptic hour with a six hour accumulation of 13 hundredths of an inch of planar ice and the number to the left there the six is the precip that occurred so 11 hundredths of precip with 1300s of planar ice on this case. So they collected more ice than we did here at the office. And as we saw it that day, the ground was still kind of cold. Most of the accumulation of ice was down on the sidewalks and that untreated surfaces. It got really slick and accumulated there, but the trees and power lines didn't have all that much ice on it in our location here. So we'll keep moving. There's some references which you can look at later. They're pretty good. And there's actually a little little DL out of the uh, training center that has some, in, some information on the ASOS sensor there. Last thing I want to mention is LSRs. Uh, typically when people report ice accumulation to us, it's the maximum accumulation they have. And so we need to keep that in mind because in this case there, there was a report of uh, four tenths to half inch of ice on the twig, but you can see if we're doing radial ice, we got to cut that number in half. So he's got next to nothing, maybe a 
eighth of an inch on one side and a half inch on the other side, so you're going to be around a quarter of an inch ice accumulation. With, but it went into the LSR as four tenths to half inch of ice because he's measuring the max amount. So that's kind of typical in these events. If we go to the next slide, here's some examples you can look at later. But one thing we could do better, I guess, is reference in the LSR where they measure the ice because we got people measuring things on trees, talking about trees, talking about sidewalks, talking about roads, a number of different sources, but they don't really say is it the maximum amount, is it the average amount of ice, that type of thing. So we can try to get that information from our contacts when we're trying to get ice information to better make some correlation between how much rain was recorded in the gauge versus how much ice accumulated on different surfaces. So that's pretty much it for the part I want to have. I want to leave some time for questions. Um, so we'll open it up to questions to either me or Phil. Well, thank you, uh, Carl and Phil. Uh, any questions for either one of our presenters today? just want to say thank you very much for providing this uh, fascinating science here and uh, and applying it to a an issue that I know is very frustrating to to all of us when you're putting out a forecast. So uh, thank you very much. Bye bye.